Good evening. evening. That's what I call some good worship right there. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. (laughs) Wendy made a quotable friend moment that I had to write down. She said, the things that we don't have is because they're the things we haven't asked for. And what does scripture say? You have not because you ask not. And so if we sing that there will be breakthrough and there will be victory here, and then we sing about the miracle working power of our God, that he's the God of miracles, right? And that he's holy and that he's worthy and all of these things. If he's the God of miracles, and if we're declaring that there's going to be breakthrough and there's going to be victory, and if we know that the only reason that we don't have is because we don't ask, then guess what we can do? We can ask. And so as we're singing that song, I was asking, Lord, I come asking tonight because there are things that I need that only you can do. There are souls that I pray for that I can't draw in, but your spirit can. There are healings that I can't perform in bodies, but you can. There is torment that I can't set people free from, but you can. And I don't want to not see them happen just because I didn't have the nerve to ask. We're supposed to come how before his throne? Boldly. We don't need to demand anything from him. All we do is ask. Oh, so good. I was praying for you today. I'm glad you're here. It's good to see you, Daryl. You're welcome. All right, over the next four weeks, we're coming into the season right now that's called Advent. And as such, I'm going to take these next four Wednesdays and teach or preach on whatever one I feel like doing at that moment, I guess, Um, (laughs) and give us like a breakdown of sorts on Advent, okay? A breakdown on this beautiful time and what it entails and You know, it brings us into an anticipation and the anticipation that there was and the anticipation that we should have um, of the hope and the joy and each thing that was fulfilled when Christ was born, right? That fulfillment, all that was held within that, every prophecy that was answered when Jesus Christ came, all right? And the purpose of Advent itself, okay, has a twofold purpose, and one is to prepare us to prepare us for the celebration of the birth of Jesus, the celebration of Christmas. How many of us prepare for Christmas in the physical? Yeah, it's December 1st, and I already feel like I'm behind. Okay, we have, what, 24 more days, and I'm already going, oh my gosh, I should be further along than this by now, right? We put preparation into getting ready for Christmas Day in the natural But there should be an anticipation that is growing within us that it's almost the time of the birth of our Savior. Not almost the time that we open the cards and we eat the good food and we watch our kids up in the presents and, okay, what if there was more of an anticipation and excitement in us just that it's the day that God fulfilled so much promise and so much prophecy because his son was born? And the other thing it does is that it reminds us that we are to be eagerly anticipating his coming again. So not just looking forward to the day we celebrate when he did come that first time, okay, but eagerly awaiting that day without even being prompted, hopefully, by any kind of message or any kind of pastor, okay, that we would eagerly await that day. Everybody say, that day. day. Yeah, the day when Christ comes to get us. Amen? Yeah. And so I would like for us to use this time of Advent, maybe like no other, all right, to be a time when we focus on Christ's coming into the world. Coming into the world, like I said, that first time, you know, as a little baby in a town far away, okay? but also his coming again when he'll step on the clouds and when we'll hear that trumpet blow and when our feet are going to leave this earth, right? 
The scripture tell us, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and those of us that are alive and remain will be caught up in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and we shall forever be with him. Yeah. That's some good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so there are four common themes of Advent, and there are four uncommon or less common themes of Advent. Last year, we did the same thing, and I went through the uncommon themes or the less common themes, which were promise, prophecy, proclamation, and presence, and we had done those one week at a time. And this week, or this year, we're going to go through the more common ones, okay, which are hope, peace, love, and joy. So each week, hope, peace, love, and joy, we're going to go through those, okay? And so these are going to be our topics that we're going to walk through. So week one, being today, all right, we're going to speak on the hope of Christmas. The hope of Christmas, which is who? Jesus. Jesus, good job. That was good. Okay. You're batting a thousand right now. Phew. I'm glad nobody shouted out the wrong answer. That would have been awkward. <laughs> so when we think of the word hope, hope is simply the confident expectation that something good lies ahead of us, right? That something good is on the horizon, that there are better days ahead than what have been behind us. It's a favorable and a confident expectation that we have, okay? To hope is to look forward to something, that, um, to look forward to it with desire, like we want it to happen. You know, we can look at things that are coming up and not have a desire for those things to be coming up, right? Like, I have a dentist appointment Monday. I don't, like, desire for Monday to get here because I want to go to the dentist, Right? But when we have a desire within us, when we want to see that thing coming up over the horizon, right? So a desire, but also a confidence that it is going to take place. What would that be considered? That's faith, right? Having confidence that what God has promised is actually going to be fulfilled. That's having faith. Having faith in our God, having faith in scripture, having faith in the things that we have read and heard and been raised up in or that are all new to us wherever we stand in this, in this life with him, right? But to the believer, hope is like a light that shines in the darkness. Have we ever went through a long tunnel, maybe on a road trip, right? Every time we drive to Florida, you get to go through that Walker Mountain something tunnel, right? And what do you try to do? You try to hold your breath through the whole thing, right? And then the husband starts driving slower and slower and slower, and you're in the passenger seat turning blue, and he's laughing. And I'm like, never mind, I'm going to breathe. <laughs> Speed up, go ahead, it's okay. But have we ever been through a dark spot in life, and we're just holding our breath, waiting to get to the end of that tunnel? Hope is that light that is at the end of that tunnel. Hope is that light in the distance that shines through the dark places or the dark patches that we're in in life. And so as we move forward, both tonight, but through this whole season of Advent, okay, we're going to reflect on and celebrate the hope that is found in Christ, the hope that we've been given in him as a gift to us, right? And so this is bigger than most of us may even realize, okay, is that we're given hope in Jesus Christ because hope can squelch all other things. Hope will squelch doubt. Hope will squelch depression. Hope will squelch anxiety. Hope will squelch torment. Hope is so much bigger than what we realize. And so we have that hope through Jesus Christ. And it's the hope that the enemy would be conquered. And it was the hope of salvation. And it was the hope of spending an eternity with our Savior, right? That's that hope that we have. Because man had no hope in saving himself, did he? There was no hope. We had no hope in saving ourselves, no matter how much good we did, no matter how much good man did, no matter how much they gave, no matter how much they put in a plate, no matter the number of times they went to the temple to sacrifice, okay? They had no hope of salvation based on their own merit, based on being able to live up to. What does scripture say? It tells us, there was none righteous, no, not one, right? In all the earth, there was none righteous until Christ came as our hope. We had no hope of atonement. The sacrifices at the temple, they did remind those ones, right? The Israelites, they reminded them the serious nature that there was in sin, 
It even reminded them of the consequences that there were to sin, okay? The fact that sin brought death, right? In the temple, sin brought death to an animal, okay? But the death of the spirit man was what would also happen if that sacrifice was not made. But the sacrifice itself, it only held or it only worked for the sins that had been committed up to that time that were being placed under that blood of that animal, right? Yeah. And then guess what? When you sinned again, atonement needed made again, over and over and over again. I would have had to have a really big herd of whatever it was that needed sacrificed, right? Yeah. And everybody say, but Jesus. But Jesus. Yeah. Jesus became the sacrifice once and for all. Yeah. That's some good stuff right there, right? The Hebrew, the heater, no. The writer of Hebrews, okay, explains it very aptly, all right? And we're going to read what's probably a larger portion of scripture than I usually bring about, but I want us to get it in all of its context, okay? But it truly shows the hope that was found in Jesus, but it also shows, shows the hopelessness that was, but also the hopelessness that is a life that doesn't put their trust in him. Because even today, even though he came as that baby, even though he died on the cross, even though he descended into hell and took back the keys, even though he ascended and now sits at the right hand of the Father, do we know that there are still ones who do not believe in him, do not live for him, do not look for him to be that atonement for their sins, right? Amen. And so it's not only those ones who were living that life, but it's also for all the ones, the hopelessness of all the ones who don't. And imagine living a life of hopelessness. And if we truly get a picture of what living a life spiritually of hopelessness would look like, then we might have a little more of a fire under us to witness to each and every one that we come in contact with, right? Amen. So we are going to read a large portion of scripture. It's found in Hebrews chapter 10. It's going to be verses 1 through 33. It says, The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming not the realities themselves. Oops, sorry. I lost my place. <laughs> For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeatedly, endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Verse 5, therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Now, if even Jesus could say those words, why are they so hard for us to say, right? Verse 8, first he said, sacrifices and offerings, burn offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Verse 9, then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. Verse 10, and by that will... We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ. Here it is, once for all. Verse 11, day after day, every priest stands. Say that word, stands. Listen to this. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. They didn't take away the sins. They covered them, but they didn't remove them. Verse 12, but then this priest, talking about Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins. It says he sat down, say that, sat down, sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Now, real quick, let's touch on that. So the high priest, over and over again, year after year, it said he stands 
and does this, right? And now it says that Jesus sits at the Father's side. Now, the priest's job was to stand until all sacrifice was done in the temple. They had to stand the entire time. Jesus is now seated. Why? Because all sacrifice has been done and has been performed, and there is no more that needs done, so he can sit and take a load off, right? He doesn't have to stand to perpetually sacrifice anymore. That's awesome. Little words that we might not pick out if we're just reading them. The high priest stands. Jesus, this priest, sits at the right hand of the Father. Verse 14, For by one sacrifice he was made perfect forever, those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Verse 18, and where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Have we ever asked for forgiveness for something that we had already asked for forgiveness for? And not because we had recommitted the sin, but just because, yes, have we ever repented perpetually for something that we had already repented for that we didn't even do again another time we just still felt guilty or we still had someone chirping in our ear about it right and so we felt like we had to repent once again no 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 what's this just say verse 18 where these have been forgiven sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary verse 19 therefore brothers and sisters since we have confidence To enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, there's that hope again, that confidence, by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain that is his body. Verse 21, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Do we all know the old hymn, Blessed Assurance? Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, lost in his blood, right? That's my story, and that's my song, and I'll sing it all the day long, right? Yes. To since we have this high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with sincere hearts in the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly, here's this word, to the hope we profess. Do we profess hope? Is that what comes out of our mouth? When people hear us speak, do they hear hope? This hope that we profess for he who promised is faithful. Verse 24, isn't this a good chunk of scripture? Yeah. We hear these verses sometimes in segments, but we don't realize that they're all packaged in there together, right? Verse 24, let us consider how we can spur each other on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and more the more as you see that day approaching. Everybody say that day. Here we are again, that day. Do we see that day approaching? Yeah. So we're supposed to be assembling and encouraging and spurring each other on, professing hope from our mouths, right? 26, if we deliberately keep on sinning, hmm, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. 28, anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Listen to this, verse 29. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Do we think of that when we sin? We're trampling the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit 
of grace. Yikes. How come nobody ever quotes that scripture? We like verse 25. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You need to be back in church. Da, 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 da. But nobody ever quotes verse 29. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? Do we ever think of that? That we can literally insult the Spirit of God? Wow. Verse 30, for we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Verse 31, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So we see, that was a lot of scripture, I know. But we see that even through the sacrifices of animals in the temple, right? Man could not save himself. All those sins could be done was covered over. They couldn't be erased, right? He could do nothing to rid himself of those things. And all the evil that was in his life, all he could do was have them covered by the blood of the animal, but not removed. But then came Jesus. Yeah. As the song says, a baby changes everything, right? So we now have hope. Everybody say, I have hope. Yeah, we now have hope of salvation that has come through our belief on the Son of God and the sacrifice he made for us once and for all, right? Romans 10, we know Romans 10, 9 and 10. We're going to read Romans 10, 9 through 13. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 11, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Verse 12, I love what Wendy was saying in her testimony earlier. Ha, oh, that God would speak to Jesus and tell him, you tell the unbelief to leave the room. Yeah. You tell the unbelief to leave the room. The same thing happened when Dorcas or Tabitha died, right? What happened? The man of God went in and he told everybody else to get out because they were all weeping and they were all crying and they were all, she's dead, she's gone. Oh no, look at all the beautiful things she made, right? Lydia. Yeah. And what did he do? He told the unbelief to leave the room. Yeah. Verse 11, for the scripture says, whoever, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Verse 12, for there is no distinction, say that, no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Verse 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Someone should be shouting hallelujah right about now. <laughs> so not only do we see that Jesus brought hope, right? Hope to those in the house of Israel, but they were those who would no longer need to sacrifice anymore, right? To cover the sin that was in their lives. But I want us to grasp how huge those words were, no distinction. That's huge that the word of God tells us there was no distinction anymore, there had been a distinction between Jew and Greek. There had been a distinction between Jew and Gentile, right? What happened? The woman comes and she talks to Jesus and she wants her son to be healed. And he goes, it's not the time for you yet. You're as a dog. What? Like, that's hard for us to grasp that Jesus would say that, right? And she goes, yes, but even the dog is allowed to eat the crumbs from the master's table. And he says, huh? Girl, you got some faith. I'm going to answer that faith. And he healed her son, right? Yeah, but there was a huge distinction between Jew and Greek, between Jew and Gentile, between Jew and Samaritan. Huge distinction. So now that Christ has come, we read here, there's no distinction. Romans chapter 10, verse 12, there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all. Who call upon him, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's where we say yes, so much yes, right? 
There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. No distinction between Israel and Gentile. Wow. That was a lot easier for the Gentile to believe than it was for the Jew to hear, right? Yeah. Yeah. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23 through 29. Listen to this. Before the coming of this faith, he's referring to faith in Jesus Christ, okay? It's what he'd been talking about in the verse prior, verse 22. So it says, before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Verse 24, now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. 27, for all of you who were baptized in Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Listen to this. Verse 28, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Verse 29, here it is. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That verse, if we could just get a grasp on Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, okay? That if we belong to Christ, that's us, that's Gentiles, that's, yeah, that's me. There ain't a bit of Jew in me. There ain't a bit of nothing in me except Irish and German, okay? If we are in Christ then we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Yeah, there's that hope again, right? Yeah. You guys with me? Okay. What'd you say? (laughs) No. (laughs) Okay, more scripture for you. We got lots of scripture tonight, but we're, we're ready to come to a close here in a couple minutes. So Romans chapter 15 I was just going to read verse 12 and 13 for you, but I had to throw four in there also. So Romans chapter 15, we're going to read verse 4 and then 12 and 13, sorry. Verse 4, for everything that was written in the past, okay, the law, the prophets, everything that had been written in the past before the book of Romans that we're in, okay, everything that was written in the past, Paul says, was written to teach us. So that through the endurance taught in the scriptures, because we learn endurance by reading the events of all these ones, right? They had endurance to keep going. Through the endurance taught to us in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have, here's our word, hope. I read all of the law. I read all of the prophets. I read everything that came before Paul wrote the book of Romans, and I see endurance, and I see hope, and I see encouragement, and I see longevity, and I see stick to and I see long-suffering, and all of those things encourage me and spur me on and let me to know if God gave them the strength to go through those things, he'll give me the same strength to make it through because he's no respecter of persons, right? Yeah. So verse 4, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. So through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Verse 12, and again Isaiah says, here this is, the hope of Christmas is Jesus, right? Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over nations in him, the Gentiles will have hope. Now, this is Paul quoting Isaiah. And think all the way back to Isaiah. Come on. Hundreds of years before Christ came. Hundreds of years earlier, for unto us a son is given, unto us a child is born, right? Hundreds of years beforehand prophesied. And Isaiah said, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over nations And in him, the Gentiles will have hope. Wow. What do you think those people around Isaiah right then when he was saying that thought? Dude, you're crazy. What are you talking about? 
A seed of Jesse, a rod of Jesse. What? What are you talking about? The Gentiles are going to have hope in him? No wonder they didn't recognize him when he came. Yeah. Verse 13, he goes on to say, May the God of, what's our word? Hope. hope. May the God, he's the God of miracles. He's the, what is that? What is him being the God of miracles? He's the God of hope. What is a miracle that we pray for? It's a confident expectation of something good that's going to come on the horizon. Hope. A miracle. How many of us could use a miracle in our own life for the life of someone we love? Yes. He's the God of miracles. He's the God of hope. Paul is saying it to us right here in Romans in verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. He can be the God of hope. Whether we believe it or not doesn't change the fact that he is. He's the God of miracles and he's the God of hope no matter what we think. But we're not going to have that joy and peace unless we trust in him as being the God of miracles and the God of hope. He's Jesus. He's the son of God. He's salvation to all who will come. But he's not salvation to everybody because all don't come. Same thing in this scripture. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as. That means we're going to do something as we trust in him. It says, so that you may overflow with. That's the NIV. The New King James Version says, as you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So if we trust in him, we're going to have joy and peace because he's the God of hope. And we're going to overflow in or abound in that hope because the Holy Spirit's going to give it to us. That's good. Yeah, this is scripture, guys. This is God's holy word. It's life to us. It's life to us as Gentiles, isn't it? Yeah, it was life to those who were born of the 12 tribes of Israel and who could, they knew who their daddy was all the way back, right? But it's also hope to us. It's also hope to us who were grafted in. Yeah. This is where our hope is found. So remember when we spoke of those long ago who waited on the coming Messiah. This was a few weeks ago and I said their future hope is our current hope, right? Their future hope was Messiah and they looked for him for hundreds of years. They looked for him. They looked for the prophecies to be fulfilled of this one who was going to come and was going to deliver them. And their future hope is our current hope. He already came and he paved that way for us and he made it for us and it's free and it's his gift to us. And all we have to do is accept it and choose it. And then he's going to come back again. Yeah. And he's going to get us all and take us home, right? Yeah. He's the only hope for all mankind. It's found in his word and it's made available to us. Through his son. You know what? If it were not written for us, we wouldn't know it, would we? We wouldn't know the saving message of Jesus Christ. If people hadn't been moved on by Holy Spirit to pen down the things that God instructed them, that brought back to their remembrance the things that had done. What does it say in New Testament? It says the world wouldn't be able to contain the books if everything that he had done had been written down. So guess what was written for us? The stuff we were going to need. The stuff that was going to get us through. The stuff that was going to be that light at the end of that dark tunnel. That's what's in here for us. Don't worry about what wasn't put in there. Don't read what wasn't put in there. If you can quote this forward and backward, okay, you probably have enough time on your hands to go ahead and study something else. But for now, guess what? Ain't none of us know this enough. but the world wouldn't be able to contain the books. As I read of last week, do we remember the man who so longed for the hope that was found in the scriptures, that was found on the written word, that while he was imprisoned, 
And he was put on the duty of cleaning the latrines in the prison. And he had found that there had been a guard or a commander who had been using pages out of the Bible as toilet paper. And as he went to clean the latrine and he wrote, he saw on there scripture. And he immediately recognized it, even though he was in, it was in English. This is over in Vietnam, right? And he immediately recognizes that as scripture. And it said, for nothing can separate us from the love of God. And it had just been the day before that, that he had told God, I'm done. I'm not praying tomorrow. I'm not quoting any scripture I know tomorrow. I'm done because here I am and life is falling apart. And I don't know where you are. I don't even know if you're real right now. John the Baptist did the same thing, right? Go and ask him if he's really the one. Prison will do that to you, right? And this man's going, I'm done. I'm not even going to pray tomorrow. And that's the day he was put on latrine cleaning duty. And that's the day that he saw for nothing can separate us from the love of God. And he took that page of the scripture out of that pot and he cleaned it and he wiped it and he wiped another man's waist off of it so that he could take it back to his jail cell. And when everyone else had went to sleep, he could read the life-giving words of the gospel. Do we love our scripture enough? To wipe another man's waist off of it so that we can read the life-giving words of Scripture. And not only that, he asked to be put on latrine cleaning detail every day after that. Because there was a whole lot of Bible left. And he wanted as many pages of it as he could get. And it was worth it to him to go through what he had to go through. Do we know what men and women of the faith have went through just so that we can have the gospel, just so that we can have Bibles, page form, tablet form, any form that we have them? Have we ever read about Tyndale and what he went through, gave his very life, that scripture could be translated into our language? Do we know these things? A good man will maybe lay down his life for someone who loves him. But we have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother that will lay down his life for all. There have been ones that have been so filled with the Spirit and so filled with a love for Scripture and God's Word that they've laid down their life to make sure it gets to other countries, to make sure it gets translated into other languages. And all we have to decide is, "Eh, do I want to read my Bible or flip the channels? Do I want to read my Bible or scroll Facebook? Do I want to read my Bible or call a friend? I'm raising my own hand. What's the first thing we reach for in the morning when we wake up? Our phone. What's the first thing we tap? Besides the alarm snooze button. What's the second thing we tap? See? Is Jesus on Snapchat? No. No. Is the first thing we open our Bible app on our phone? I'm talking to myself, too. What's the first thing we tap? Oh, let me see if anybody liked my picture since last night when I checked it last. Oh, let me see if anybody put a nice little comment on something. Or do we go, wow, I was so sad that I fell asleep last night right in the middle of Romans 10, and and I can't even remember where I was at, and I'm going to have to go back and find it because I can't wait to get more of that inside of me. Do we have that desire in us? And if we don't, We just have to ask for it, right? What did Wendy tell us? The things that we don't have is just because they're the things we haven't asked for. I want that desire in me. I have it in there. It's just squelched sometimes. I have it in there. It gets covered up and dusty sometimes. I have it in there. I want it to be at the surface inside of there, right? All we have to do is ask. God, will you please give me a desire for your word? Will you give a desire to me? That before I crave and hunger for for physical food, I'll crave and hunger for your word instead. That's the description of a living and active hope that's found in God's word. It's the hope of the gospel and it's the hope of salvation. It's the hope of chains broken. It's the hope of marriages restored. It's the hope of prison walls crumbled. It's the hope of addictions being uh, broken free off of people. It's the hope of captives set free. It's the hope of Christmas. And that hope is who? That hope is Jesus. 
Yes. If Mercy Music wants to come to the front, the hope of Christmas is Jesus. We have three more weeks in this series. We're going to go over joy, and we're going to go over love, and we're going to go over peace. The hope of Christmas is Jesus. The peace of Christmas is Jesus. The love of Christmas is Jesus. The joy of Christmas is Jesus. What does Pastor Steve say to us all the time? It's always been about Jesus. It's always going to be about Jesus. It's going to be about nothing other than Jesus, right? 